for further questions to enhance that. Thank you. So write your questions down on the white cards that you've been passed out because at the end of the session we'll have time for Q&A with Dr. Rezioni and the rest. So it's a pleasure to introduce Dr. Marion Neuhauser who's an expert on nutrition uh, in relationship to cancer and she'll give us uh, an update relative to prostate cancer. Mary? Thank you, Pete. Good morning, everyone. It's great to see such a big crowd on uh, a rainy Saturday. I hear we're going to get some sun tomorrow so everyone can get out and get their walks tomorrow. <laughs> so many patients wonder, will what I eat or how much I weigh impact whether or not my prostate comes back or worsens? And to answer this question, we really need research because research provides evidence. And as Dr. Etzioni mentioned in her talk, all patient guidelines should be evidence-based. It's very tempting to go on the internet or go down to the university bookstore or go on to Amazon and look for, you know, a book or some information on nutrition. But a lot of that is uh, what we call junk science. You know, we've heard a lot about uh, fake news over the last six months. <laughs> Well, fake science has been around a lot longer than fake news. So we really need to have, you know, science, nutrition science guide clinical guidelines. And that's what we're trying to do in our studies here on nutrition and prostate cancer. The study that we're doing now is called the Prostate Cancer Active Lifestyle Study, or PALS. And the principal investigator is John, Dr. Jonathan Wright, who's sitting right over there, and he'll be the next speaker and can talk a little bit more about some of the trial as well. And these days we realize that a lot of studies, especially large studies, um, requires teams. It's not necessarily just one person working in a lab, but it requires teams. So we have a large team um, on this study, and um, our names are mentioned there, and here's our logo. So the overall goal of the PAL study is to test whether a lifestyle intervention, so this is a clinical trial, it's an intervention, and it's based on weight loss through diet and physical activity in men with low-grade prostate cancer who are on active surveillance will improve blood and prostate tissue biomarkers of glucose regulation. Oh, I think we lost the signal again. Well, I'll keep talking. You might be wondering, why are we looking at glucose regulation? Don't you want to look at prostate cancer? Isn't that what you're really interested in? Well, there's a couple of reasons why this is what we call our endpoint of the trial. Uh, first of all, if we have prostate cancer or progression as the endpoint in the trial, we need a really large study and we need a really long study. We receive our funding from the National Cancer Institute, which is part of the National Institutes of Health, and they typically will fund trials for four to five years. And so within that time frame, we would need to have such a large study where sufficient numbers of men would progress on to have a recurrence or more advanced uh, disease to be able to find a result that we could call statistically significant. In other words, um, not a null value. And so instead, what we often do in these uh, diet and exercise trials is we use what we call a surrogate endpoint biomarker. And these biomarkers are ones that are on the way to cancer, so they're in the middle. So we have a risk factor, which might be weighing too much or having poor diet or poor physical activity. Those lifestyle factors influence what we call a surrogate endpoint biomarker. And those surrogate endpoint biomarkers are on the pathway to the disease. So we have a short time frame and we have a relatively small sample size because funds are limited. And so that's why we are measuring these biomarkers. And one of the reasons that we are measuring glucose is that impaired glucose regulation is likely involved with how cells in the prostate replicate and how cells become um, you know, bad, bad partners in the disease. And so our hope is that these uh, improvements in glucose regulation both in the blood as well as in prostate tissue 
because men on active surveillance have biopsies every year so we can look at these things in the prostate tissue. It's hoped that these improvements will reduce the risk of prostate cancer progression. So that's our overall goal. So here is our study design. Uh, to be involved in PALS, patients must be on active surveillance for their treatment and they must weigh more than what would be their ideal uh, body weight. And so they're randomized. Um, we heard at the, at the beginning that later today you're going to hear a little bit more about what a clinical trial is, but, and this is a clinical trial. Men are randomized to either the intervention, which is based on a program called the Diabetes Prevention Program, or control. And control is just their usual care. You know, they do get to meet with our study team at the beginning of the study and then um, at the end of the study. And they're given all of the intervention materials at the end of the study, but they have their usual care with their urologist. Uh, so what happens is men have uh, their diagnostic biopsy and if they uh, qualify, if they're on active surveillance and meet some of the other study criteria, uh, then they are randomized to either the intervention or the control and at the beginning before they start the intervention we um, take a blood sample, we um, do an exercise test to make sure that their heart is healthy enough to undergo exercise. Uh, they complete several questionnaires on their usual diet, the usual physical activity. We take their weight, their waist circumference, we do a, a body scan where we can um, look and see where their fat is distributed. And then they're in the study for six months. So for those who were in the intervention, they come here to this building, I'll show you some photos in the next couple of slides, where they meet on a rather intensive basis with our study nutritionist and also an exercise specialist. So they receive a lot of instruction about how to modify their diet, what you do when you're going out, you know, what you do on Super Bowl Sunday, how do you manage holidays, all those things that are hard for patients to maintain, you know, a good healthy dietary pattern. And then uh, both the intervention and the control men come in um, at the end of six months and they repeat all of the measures and then again at 12 months they come in for some of the same measures. In this last what we six months that we call the post-intervention period, men are not coming in for instruction, but we're giving them a little bit of information because it's it's very hard for most people. It doesn't matter if you've had a cancer diagnosis or not. It's very hard to change diet on your own. Some people can do it, but most people you benefit from some help and some guidance. So the nutrition component of the diabetes prevention program, which has been a very successful program to uh, prevent and treat diabetes and even some cancers, emphasizes reduced calories through smaller portion sizes and food choices. So it's not just how much you eat, but it's what you eat as well. Um, lower fat content because fat has more calories than carbohydrate or protein. In fact, over twice as many more calories in uh, fat than carbohydrate or protein. Uh, we teach men how to carefully monitor their daily food intake. Uh, we teach patients how to be mindful of what they eat, to think about how much they eat and you know where they are and all of that context around eating. And importantly, there are no magic foods or food groups that have to be completely eliminated. So again, this is where some of the fake nutrition science that's on the internet and in the bookstores comes into play. If you see something that sounds too good to be true, it probably is. It's just like investing money. If you know, there's no um, get rich quick scheme. There's no uh, lose weight quick scheme. You know that is healthy and beneficial for the long term. So the food type and the food amount is key, and this is what our study nutritionist uh, works uh, very carefully with the patients on. Um, she teaches them how to measure their foods, teaches them how to think about how to plan meals and snacks and so forth. And for a lot of men, it's a big change, and we always welcome their uh, spouses or partners to come in and be part of the sessions as well. And we have found that so far um, there has been success in, in weight loss, so we're, we're pleased with that. They also participate in physical activity. Right here in this building down on the E-level is where the men come for 
There are sessions both with the nutritionist and then we have this fabulous um, exercise facility within our prevention center. And the men can choose to either have um, individual you know, drop-in sessions or we have a, a great uh, exercise physiologist that also works with men to uh, customize their particular you know, prescription for exercise for this particular intervention. So what are the next steps? Uh, PALS is enrolling men with early stage prostate cancer who are on active surveillance. We will not have study results for several years, but we're optimistic about the success. And other health benefits are weight reduction, good diet and physical activity, improves overall health and reduces the risk of other diseases such as cardiovascular disease and diabetes. And our long-term goals include dissemination and implementation. Those are two words that we hear a lot around the scientific and particularly the cancer community these days, dissemination and implementation. Well, what does that mean? That means that the scientific results that we find get translated to clinical care. They get applied to clinical care. And so in the clinical practice setting, uh, physicians, either family practice physicians, internists, or urologists can advise patients on some of these things and so patients don't go to the internet to get the fake science. And unfortunately, the time lag between new scientific discoveries, and this is not just nutrition science, but it's all science, and applications to patients or health policy is way too long. The average is about 17 years. So we want to you know, decrease that, that time length. And there is you know, quite a bit of active uh, thought in this area, especially at the level of the NIH, they're developing a lot of new dissemination and implementation um, research protocols to really decrease that, that time because 17 years on average is way too long. If PALS is successful, we would like to broaden the intervention to more patients at more sites with the eventual hope that it becomes standard of care. And if you know someone or if you yourself have had a heart attack, you probably know about cardiac rehab. Well, cardiac rehab comes with nutrition counseling, it comes with physical therapy and exercise therapy and so on. Cancer doesn't have any of that. So we really need to have, you know, a cancer rehab type of program. But we need, you know, insurers to pay for that and it's, you know, kind of a large problem. But that would really be our hope is that, um, you know, cancer rehab with uh, weight control, nutrition, and physical activity, and all kinds of other important lifestyle features could become part of the cancer care process. And then finally, just to reemphasize again, the clinical guidelines should be evidence-based. And I think we'll have questions um, at the end after all the panel comes up here. Thank you very much. Thank you, Marion. Uh, write your questions down. I'm sure you'll have a lot of nutrition questions. So our next speaker is Dr. Jonathan Wright. He's a professor in the Department of Urology at the University of Washington. He's a surgeon and a scientist, and he'll, I think, tell us a bit about what we should be doing with exercise. Anyone need to make a phone call? <laughs> 